Good morning. Welcome to our next series in the Pinnacle webinar series brought to you today by Pitch and Associates and our education partner, Ninth Brain, and our strategic partner, First Watch. Uh, First Watch has been a strategic partner with Pinnacle from early on and continues to be a wonderful supporter, and we're excited to come into this next session that they will be providing us today, Building Resilience to Prevent PTSD, Decrease Suicides, and Increase Happiness. Today's speakers are Todd Stout and Mike Tagman of First Watch. And gentlemen, I'm pleased to turn it over to you. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> to, get us, uh, to get us oriented and started here a little bit, um, walk you through um, how to uh, how to kind of maximize your experience on the WebEx. Um, so if you'd uh, start by going to the, the little bar at the uh, top here and um, select um, select uh, participants, now uh, you'll be able to uh, open that up here. And, and if you would uh, also open up the chat window, you can keep those uh, uh, windows uh, open and kind of minimized on your, on your desktop. And if you uh, would like to um, send a, a question, uh, to any of us, um, you can uh, you can do it through the the chat box or by uh, by raising your hand. We'll show you those here in a second. <coughs> um, we would like to take a virtual roll call today for those of you on the WebEx. Um, so uh, please uh, go to the the, the host and panel and uh, and uh, let us let us know you're here. And if you're uh, if you've got a number of other uh, people in the room with you, if you would uh, mind typing in your uh, your agency and how many people are in the room with you, so we can have a count of uh, of participants today. That would be that would be fabulous. And you just uh, send the message to the host, presenter, and panelists. That'd be wonderful. Um, and then if you're uh, <coughs> um, have got a desire to uh, to ask a question um, down at the uh, uh, bottom here, I'm not sure why these slides are kind of advancing on their own here. Um, the there's a, a spot down there with a little hand symbol. If you uh, touch the hand symbol, you'll be able to raise your hand, um, which will alert us that you've got a question and we can unmute you and, uh, and hear you and you can uh, talk and ask questions. Otherwise, you can uh, just type your uh, question into the, uh, into the chat window, into the chat window. So um, as we <coughs> said earlier, this is the uh, Pinnacle webinar series um, and sponsored by First Watch. Um, this is a, uh, a uh, precursor uh, to the uh, Pinnacle EMS Leadership Conference, which if you have not uh, been able to uh, attend live, um, is uh, certainly the, uh, the premier uh, leadership conference <coughs> in the emergency medical services world. And um, it is gonna be in Orlando this year, uh, July 22nd to uh, the 26th. And you know, we certainly uh, hope, you'll, uh, hope you'll join us. Um, this morning, um, our <laughs> session is going to be uh, presented by two of us. Um, we've got uh, Jim Marshall, who is uh, a psychologist and uh, trauma therapist and all around incredibly good guy. Um, Jim, do you want to introduce yourself to folks here real quick? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, first, just grateful that you've prioritized spending this, this time with us today. Of all the issues that we could cover, what's more core to our response system is the infrastructure, the human infrastructure. So thank you for investing in your people every day and then taking time with us today. And so my work is as director of 9 Training Institute, I've been embedded in the 911 family for uh, about 14 years, um, riffing and actually building on my experience as a trauma therapist. Uh, so I've been in private practice since uh, 1996. I began actually doing clinical work in 1987. My sister, Deborah, uh, is a dispatcher. Uh, and she's retired now, Deborah, Deborah Oxenberg. And uh, she dragged me into the field and told me that her people needed real training that was fit and designed for them as now professionals. And then a guy named Jay Fitch, which some of you know, <laughs> and many of you or all of you know, uh, pulled me in to teach ASM, the Ambulance Service Managers course a number of years ago, and CCM, which is the Communication Center Managers course. Uh, and then he pulled me into Pinnacle, and I could see I could see why I was very grateful for that. I, um, I I am the student of EMS. I'm not an expert in EMS, but I try to bring all I can to bear that now customized to what you folks do as well. So the Training Institute is all about training, providing you with resilience training and equipping 
uh, and then also how to manage the most difficult calls and runs involving mental illness and suicide. And so that is my life's passion, uh, and that is why we write and uh, teach and train. And uh, I'm just grateful to be here today, Mike, with you. Thank you, Jim. Um, and folks, I'm Mike Tegman. I'm the Improvement Guide for First Watch. Um, I know many of you I see, uh, <coughs> see a lot of uh, familiar names on the, uh, on the participants list here this morning. I've uh, been involved in EMS this is uh, my 45th year, I think it is. And um, for, uh, for the last uh, couple of years um, with our uh, team at First Watch, um, we've had um, a lot of uh, customers um, be particularly concerned about um, issues around uh, provider depression, PTSD, suicide, those kinds of things. And, and they've been asking us to build uh, triggers for them. Uh, that will alert like their chaplain or their CISM team or their uh, company psychologist uh, that somebody has run up uh, either a series or a, a particularly um, uh, emotionally uh, traumatic call so we can uh, they can get them help help quickly and um, as we've been thinking about that it's like that that's helpful and that's and that's great but it, it, it hasn't seemed uh, quite adequate so uh, we spent the about the last year and a half really uh, uh, really researching uh, resilience and understanding that, and, uh, and that's kind of what brought us to this uh, this this topic today. Um, and I'll I'll give you a little little bit of a baseline orientation, and then we'll uh, uh, dive in. This is uh, it's going to sound a little bit like I'm interviewing Jim, but knowing uh, uh, Jim, who's got a uh, uh, podcast and basically has worked as a radio talk show uh, person on this uh, on this topic, he'll probably toss the interview back this direction. Uh, some as well. That's correct, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds good. Well, one of the things we know <clears throat> about um, the you know the issues around PTSD and uh, and suicide um, is that you know people who who suffer PTSD, um, which is uh, was probably is probably under under diagnosed um, in our in our society. Um, have a, a significantly higher, I think, Jim, you've said in the past, like six times higher uh, likelihood correct. of suicide as compared to the general population. Yes, that's and, correct. And they've done, uh, they've done research on, uh, on people who have attempted suicide. It is, uh, it is very difficult to actually uh, do research on people who have uh, suicided successfully. They make poor interview uh, subjects. Uh, but for people who have um, made serious attempts and uh, and while they're be, being treated in the hospital, there are a few research projects uh, where they've gone in and, and administered standardized uh, resilience tests to them, and pretty uniformly they have uh, have pretty low resilience. Um, so I'm going to just kind of walk you through <clears throat> a context for for how to kind of place this. Um, and people, um, when they get into uh, get into EMS or fire service or law enforcement as a career. Um, most people are, are moving along the, the path and the, the road of their career, and then occasionally they'll hit a bump of some kind. And that bump can be uh, a big trauma like the, the shooting at the office complex in San Bernardino or the, <coughs> uh, the um, this is one of my neighbors getting rescued from uh, mudslides here in uh, Montecito or the, uh, the tornadoes that have uh, hit uh, several communities in the Midwest this year. Um, or the, the shooting at the, the country bar in Ventura. Um, and for um, those situations, um, we have the CISM uh, peer support and EAP, and we'll uh, <clears throat> definitely spend a, a chunk of time talking about that. Um, and then uh, one, of the, one of the things that noticed um, in our industry is that when an event happens, you know, there tends to be a lot of attention uh, in the first couple of weeks after that, but uh, but then it's like after all the CSM processes are done and the, the therapy dogs have gone back home, um, there's not much left for people. Um, so uh, one right. of the things we'll uh, we'll definitely want to talk about is is post event support, um, which uh, uh, Jim uh, has a has a good description of, and <laughs> um, and if you really want to uh, dive into it after this call, you can check out his book. Uh, the resilient 911 professional, um, which I know he uh, he's always uncomfortable with promoting his own work, but I feel really comfortable uh, promoting his work. His uh, his book is a fabulous 
fabulous guy that anybody who's in leadership in EMS should uh, should take a look at. Um, and then on the on the front side, um, there's the concept of resilience, and and resilience is uh, it's, you know it's kind of building yourself up, building your strength. We uh, in our in our world we tend to go to the go to the gym to uh, to exercise so that we can uh, lift heavy people down several flights of stairs and not uh, hurt our back in the process. Well, uh, resilience building is is very similar to taking your your brain your psychology, your emotions to the gym and building strength so that you can uh, you can take hits and are uh, less likely to, to have problems associated with them and then uh, and then kind of leadership for this uh, this whole thing. So um, to start with let's let's start with the the, the issue around um, PTSD or some some people call it uh, post-traumatic stress injury. Um, Jim, can you kind of walk us through kind of what is that and how do, how do we know that somebody might have it? Okay, so thank you. And this, you did a great job on that introduction, Mike. And I love the idea of resilience getting ahead of the, the risk factors to prepare people to manage them better. Um, you know, whether, and I will, will say too, you can be the strongest person in your comm center. You can be the strongest person in your, in your, in your agency as a, uh, as a medic. Uh, and I've had, you know, medics and uh, other responders come to me and say, you know, for 20 years, nothing bothered me. Then I went on that run or I hit that call and it's like, I don't know, something's different now and I'm having difficulty sleeping. You know, so uh, to, to describe this in a nutshell, we'll take a man named Michael Stanley. This is a real, real dear friend of mine. He's now passed, not related to suicide, but later in life, he, he died of other causes. But the point is, uh, Mike, now this is, I want to, when we're defining PTSD, you guys, please don't fall asleep. Because if you think I'm going to just give you a grid with 20 symptoms, you should fall asleep. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I'd rather, I'd rather tell you about Mike. Not Mike Tegman right now, Mike Stanley. So he was with Charleston uh, Consolidated 911 Center, but he was a medic after U.S. Navy, 17 years U.S. Navy, then 17 years as a medic. Uh, he lost one of his sons. It was a drowning accident. And I don't say that lightly. I know that this could be... a hard to hear for some of you who have had similar things happening. And, I, and, and on that note, please uh, send us a message, uh, the contact information you're going to receive at the end of this. If you need to talk about anything that's going on, you need bridging to take care of because this, this presentation has activated something for you and you don't know where to go with it, please follow the contact information at the end of this. Let's make sure that we bridge you the support that you need. Okay, so back to Mike Stanley. Uh, he lost a son to drowning. He was nine years old. Well, as many EMS pros can relate to, uh, lo and behold, it becomes personal at some point. He then goes, uh, he's sent to a, a scene, a scene of a nine-year-old who had, may not make it, who was, uh, it was a water accident. He cannot resuscitate this boy. The boy uh, is, it passes. Now, what you have is, in, for many people with PTSD, there's past trauma that then is activated and, and, and develops into PTSD when other traumatic events take place. So those most at risk are those who have a history of, of traumatic experiences. They've been exposed to something with a serious risk of injury or death, uh, and, and, and through that exposure, they may or may not have actively experienced intense fear, horror, or helplessness, but things start to happen in their life. So Mike, what happened after this drowning event uh, that he was called to and the death of his own son, he began having difficulty with terrible nightmares, uh, intrusive dreams. So the first part of PTSD is intrusive re-experiencing of the event. So uh, terrible nightmares, flashbacks, where you, it feels like you're back there in time. You can hear it, you can feel it, you can see it, you can smell it, you can taste it even. So, so it doesn't mean you're completely out of touch with reality, which is the definition of psychosis, but you're re-engaged with it in a powerfully, emotionally loaded way. Those are flashbacks. Also, triggers. So, you know, um, thankfully, First Watch is talking about triggers as in software triggers to activate a good response to these events to provide help. But when we talk about triggers that are happening psychologically for the person who's experienced traumatic events and now struggling with PTSD, we mean that now it's the, it's the, it's the veteran who is on July 4th hearing what to him is not fireworks, it's mortar. So, boom, these explosions bring them back, it activates the flashback, it activates what else? Hypervigilance. So a lot of our responders live with hypervigilance, so we're way over-activated, keenly watching out for danger. 
That doesn't mean you have PTSD, that's conditioning. But it also can be a part of post-traumatic stress disorder where I can't dial down my vigilance. I'm always ramped up with cortisol and I'm looking for danger constantly. You know, where, where do you sit in the restaurant? Is it in the middle of the place or is it with your back against the wall? And one other uh, element of PTSD, not that I'm explaining all of it, is the uh, exaggerated startle reflex. So I'm just so jacked up that if my, my kid drops a fork on the plate when I'm not looking at dinner, bah, and I'm freaking. So, you know, these are elements of PTSD. What do we have? We've got the intrusive re-experiencing, but then there's one other thing. I don't want to feel this stuff. I don't want to remember it. So for Mike, he tried to block it out of his mind. He tried to keep sucking it up and not dealing because it was too painful to think about that call, that event, or even his own son. He was trying to avoid, and that's automatic. It's not even intentional. It also can be intentional. So I don't want to be around people, places, situations that remind me of the event. I want to do things. I don't want to think of things that are going to remind me of the event. And now you folks, I hope you're actively tuned in right now and listening. I hope we're, you're, this is meaningful to you. Because let me just say this. You can judge those who are now, they've gone from partying and drinking some to now they are loading up and they are drunk a lot of the time. And now maybe even they're getting disciplined because they came to work and they're still drunk in the morning. Uh, the self-medicating is part of the avoidance. It's a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. We've got to reach in and recognize the risk factors and the potential of PTSD before we discipline. We might have to pull them off the rigs, but we've got to get them to help and evaluate and make sure that self-medicating from somebody who hasn't in the past is not happening as an explanation for the, the problem. So, Mike, that was, that was a lot I threw at you. Let me just say one more thing. I like that you said... I like that you said post-traumatic stress disorder is also post-traumatic stress injury because as everybody listening here knows, the stigma for responders to call something a disorder, psychological disorder, is deep and thick still. And we need to recognize, look, what we're talking about is an injury in the line of duty. As you said, you need to be in condition as a medic for lifting people. Well, what happens when a, when a medic pulls their back out? They've got a, they've got a work-related injury because they lifted even the right way. It was just the wrong lift and now they're out of work. Well, what about when somebody lifts psychologically and they strain their brain, not the back? Post-traumatic stress injury is what we need to see this as, as leaders, as, as frontline people, and embrace and provide support for it. Hey, Jim. Well, you know, it's what Mike, I'm sorry, one second. Um, we've had a couple people say that, and, and I can hear it as well, Jim's voice uh, for some reason is a little muffled and a little hard to understand, so I don't know if there's anything you think you could do, Jim, but we'd appreciate it if you could try. Okay, I, I just put myself on up. Is this any better? Yes, sir, very much. That's okay, great. I apologize for that. Thank you. Well, okay. One of the things I, uh, I, I appreciate about using the term post-traumatic stress injury is that uh, uh, injury is usually something people think they can heal from, um, where a disorder feels like it's something they're stuck with forever. Um, so I, I mm. like that distinction. And actually, there's one uh, in my in my uh, reading on on neuropsychology. There's a, a description of two different kinds of memory. There's extrinsic memory and intrinsic memory. Um, so uh, to, to, to illustrate this, uh, Jim, do you do you remember learning to drive? when you first learned to drive a car. <laughs> I absolutely do, because our instructor had a hangover and he just told us to drive the Dairy Queen 20 miles away. <laughs> uh, so so who, who was it that taught you to drive, do you remember? What's that? Who was his it, name who was, was Dale. I won't say his last name, his yes. name was Dale. His name was Dale, was hungover, okay? So and yeah. all of you listening, if you think back to learning to drive, um, you experience that as what's referred to as an extrinsic memory. <clears throat> which means it's something that you know happened in the past that you're, uh, you're kind of bringing up. Um, whereas um, most of you have probably driven a, an automobile or a motorcycle within the last week. And um, realistically, it's memory that allows you to, to drive and start your vehicle with your push button or twisting your key and uh, use the brake and accelerator and, and steering in such a way that you don't run into other things. It's memory that allows you to do that but most of us don't experience that as, as memory from something a long time ago. It's just something we kind of know how to do now, and that's referred to as intrinsic memory. <laughs> one, of the, one of the neuropsychological theories about post-traumatic stress injury is that when a, an event happens, you know, you're, you're shot at or you see one of your buddies get blown up in an IED or, or something like that, 
that your that gets encoded as shards of intrinsic memory rather than extrinsic memory. Um, so mm -hmm. when the fireworks go off, it feels like you're being mortared or shot at right now, not like it was something that happened in the past. Um, and it's my understanding that some of the some of the therapies um, used to treat um, post-traumatic stress disorder and <laughs> post-traumatic stress injury um, are really designed to kind of weave those um, intrinsic memory shards back together um, so that they're in ex extrinsic memory so you can still be sad about them. You know it's something that happened in the past, but you know it's something that happened in the past and isn't, uh, isn't happening right now. And, and Jim, I know that there's uh, has been some research that the earlier and faster that you can intervene uh, with somebody um, immediately after or sometimes even during an event, um, that you can uh, decrease the chance that they'll uh, suffer uh, post-traumatic stress injury or the severity. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about um, what what kinds of things work in that in that circumstance? Okay, very good. So yeah, I think I can compliment Mike what you're saying, and folks, for you as listeners, I think it'll pull together some of what Mike is is saying here uh, as we learn more. So first, let me just emphasize uh, that um, there. What we do early on in, in when somebody's been through a traumatic event has to be from a clinician who's using evidence-based treatment. Uh, the lay efforts, like pulling everybody, a debriefing should never, ever, ever be mandatory because if you do that too, too early, that can cause the reverse effect. Um, certainly we want to be able to offer them spaces where they can release and unload and talk if they're ready to do that. Uh, we, the basic things we can do to provide comfort and be able to give them breaks from work, that's great. I just want to emphasize that when we talk about going in early to heal trauma or to decrease the, 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 uh, the uh, ultimate effect of that trauma, that is using evidence-based treatments, EBTs, evidence-based treatments. Um, now, if you're taking notes, I just want you to ur I want to urge you to write down these four letters, E-M-D-R-I, movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. This is one of the evidence-based treatments I began using in 1990. So when, and it's been proven effective by the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration, it meets the standards of the highest level of research and, and the results are there. I, I wanna say this, you can heal PTSD. Most of your medics out there, 90 plus percent of your medics, this is my estimate, don't even know you can heal PTSD. They believe you only can learn to manage the symptoms and therapy will only help them cope with the symptoms. This is not accurate. If people will get help with EMDR or other evidence-based treatments, they can heal this. What does that mean? Now, to Mike, to your point about the intrinsic, extrinsic, you know, what are we doing to memories to create healing in individuals, to help them heal? We're accessing the elements of that memory, the pictures, the emotions, the thoughts, and the sensations. Those are there. Now, they may be locked in. They're locked in the nervous system in what we would call a neural network. But pictures, emotion, thoughts, sensations, think of that as PETS, P-E-T-S. What we're doing is we're accessing that neural network, that cluster of information and we are desensitizing it and reprocessing, but we're desensitizing the emotional aspects and the bodily uh, activated memories. So like when you, when, the, when the, uh, the medic thinks of going back to that scene that was horrific for them, they start to get chest palpitations. They feel sick in their stomach. We're gonna activate the picture with the person. We're gonna bring up the worst part of the picture. We're gonna allow them to connect with those bodily uh, the feelings along with the emotions, and the thought might be a survivor's guilt. It might be, I failed to help that person. They should have lived. So that's the thought that's part of the traumatic memory. Um, Mike, is this okay so far, or am I going too far into the weeds? No, this is exactly what I was hoping for. Okay, all righty. So folks, folks, bear with me. I want to make this as concrete as I possibly can so it's not like out there ethereal. So, you know, for Mike Stanley, come back to him. You know, I, I failed. I failed. I should have done more. That's the cognition. Uh, his emotion, deep sorrow, deep regret. Uh, he feels it in his chest and in his stomach. And, and part of the thought might have been, I don't deserve to live, okay? Um, so if we were to do EMDR with Mike, we're going to have him zoom in on that. We're going to have him set up a goal cognition. What would the goal thought be that he'd like to be able to experience? It might be, I did the best I can, but people die. 
I did the best I can, but people died. Now, good luck trying to convince Mike to believe that. <laughs> he just can't convince people to believe the stuff, and you know what I'm talking about. But when you activate reprocessing of that information, it, it actually helps the thought process to shift. It also helps the emotion to drop off, and it, sh it shifts from guilt and shame or, or sorrow to relief and a sense of peace and calm as you're reprocessing that. And the bodily stuff falls out. It, it's no longer there the same way. So that person then, if they were to go back to that scene, they're not going to feel as they did before. It's going to really feel like it's over, that they did the best they could, and it's not going to activate all the bodily stuff. Now, that might sound too good to be true, but it's not. This is the way we can uh, use treatments like EMDR uh, to help people heal this. That, that sounds good, Jim. And, I, and just while we're, while we're on kind of these evidence-based therapies, um, and there are two others I know that uh, have, have pretty good science behind them. There's uh, prolonged exposure therapy and cognitive processing therapy. Can you mm -hmm. just give us a quick overview so that people have kind of a complete picture of the, of the things that science has shown are helpful? Yes, so exposure therapy is also a very effective, uh, and this is where you re-engage the person in the elements of the traumatic experience. They describe it, they walk through it, and the more that they, they process through it, the more they reactivate it and, and, and uh, re repeatedly um, work through it and think through it, there's actually a desensitization that's beginning to happen. So they are exposing themselves to the very thing they would otherwise avoid, and through that exposure to it, they find uh, over time this is shifting the way that, the, the, your, that your, your nervous system is relating to it, uh, and uh, there's there's more acceptance and there's a de-escalation of the distress related to it. Uh, I, I personally, as a clinician, uh, exchanged exposure therapy for EMDR. I'll be honest, but. Uh, there are clinicians using it, and it can be very effective. I, I wouldn't dissuade you from using it. It is effective. The other one, as you said, uh, cognitive restructuring, this is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy, and this is where you're helping the person through a process of, of discussion and exercises uh, to be able to rethink their experience and to challenge the thoughts, the, uh, the emotions, uh, and be able to reevaluate very, very carefully how they're now relating to it so they can come to the recognition that it's really past, that it's really over. There's a lot more to it than that, but it has to do with directly helping the person challenge core beliefs uh, and the images associated with that. So it's my fault I failed. You, you're pursuing I did the best I could for, as an example. That that sounds good, and I, I apparently a few people are asking questions about uh, if we're still on the, the on the slide that says leadership. And yes, we're uh, <clears throat> we're pretty slide light um, for this uh, this particular webinar. We do have a, a couple of others we'll uh, we'll walk through here at some point, but um, um, it's it's really about um, uh, kind of unpacking uh, some of the the brilliance that's in Jim's brain. Um, and it was uh, oh, easier on. to do this through a, through, a, through a dialogue here. So, in that in that spirit, um, you know the 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 whole issue around um, you know we we have an incident, we bring in peer support and and therapy dogs and um, psychologists and do debriefings and <laughs> a lot of attention uh, for a couple weeks, maybe three weeks. And then it's kind of like back to business as usual, and some of the people most effective um, may not have uh, completed their healing journey. Um, and Jim, you're one of the, the few people I've run across in the in the trauma therapy field that has really kind of described a framework for for managing uh, things for the long term from a post event uh, perspective. So can you spend some time kind of uh, walking us through? Um, kind of the best ways to to think about and manage uh, people for for the long term for the year or two after uh, after an incident until they they can truly be fully healed. Sure. Uh, and so, folks, what I want to do with this again, if we just talk theory here, you're going to pass out, <laughs> or you're going to get preoccupied because you guys have busy lives. Uh, let me just 
bring this back to uh, the story of Mike Stanley again, and we'll uh, we'll apply this. First of all, we recognize that there are events that you're going to you go through uh, as an as an organization, as a, an EMS family, that we would we could call high impact events. Now, a high impact event may be only a one run for one medic. It may only affect that one medic, and we need to have support for that person. The process I'm going to describe for you can be used for that person. Say it's the death of a child. These are the, some of the calls and the runs that you guys that are the most impacting psychologically for our responders. Um, so the process I'm going to describe to you can be applicable to even though it only affected that one medic, they still need a continuum of care because to Mike Tagman's point, and, and this is not, uh, please don't slap yourself down with, if you can identify with this. The reality is that in the responder world day to day, you move on from that event, why? Because there's another one and then another one. You have to keep staying in the present. The problem is the accumulation is not recognized with follow through. What about how the person is doing not just that week, but the next month, the next three months, the next six months? There's insidious, invisible pile up accumulation within our medics, within our other responders that ends up taking this toll that we're recognizing, increased suicidality, increased depression, self-medication, relationship failures. So we need a systematic approach to be able to attend to and provide the care that our responders need through that full continuum of care out beyond even one, one year. Now the question is, well, how do we do that, Jim? You know, that's nice theory. But how do you actually, how can we keep track? And how do we even begin by connecting and assessing what each person needs in our agency after events? Well, let me unpack that in a minute. But let me just come back and say that high impact events also include those that involve many of our uh, people in our, our personnel. So when there's a suicide among our medics, which unfortunately is happening uh, way too frequently, often we feel helpless in the aftermath of that to know what to do. And part of us just wants to get through it and move on, get life as usual, because we don't like staying in helplessness. So if we can avoid collectively and move on and hope that everyone's okay, that's not because we don't care and we lack character as a leader. It's that we really don't know what else to do. So here's what I'm proposing. And this, you guys, this is, um, this is referenced, um, I, I guess I'm going to make reference to it. I, I don't like doing this, but this is a chapter in the Resilient Island Professional, and it's all detailed out there. It's open source. Anyone can use it. You don't have to pay for it. But it's called the Post-Event Personnel Care Planner. And what are we saying? We can plan to take care of our personnel, and how do we do that? Um, so let's take this back to Mike Stanley. Actually, multiple people on, in his uh, group were deeply affected by the death of his child. That would have been an event that we'd want to begin plan, uh, planning for to support him. But then when the, when the death of the child on the scene, six months later, the same age as his son takes place, okay, now we really need to do some post-event care planning with our personnel, right? So what does that mean? Imagine a grid, imagine a sheet that we fill out. And if we have a peer support team, I'm going to just dream that you do or somebody that's designated to pay attention and follow up with care. Uh, Mike, how am I doing so far? Is this, is this, this on is track exactly, to too granular? This is exactly what I was hoping for, yeah. Okay, all righty. So, so let's, there we are. We've got Mike, we've got his team though, and you've got, pe you've got people coming to supervisors and go, listen, man, we're falling apart. Like, we can't keep our eye on the ball. We're just, we're way down. We've got people calling in like they, it, it, we've never had this happen before. Or everybody looks like they're fine. They're all pushing on, but, it, you know, the words are right, but the music's all wrong. Whether it's obvious if people are showing the struggle or they're trying to bury the struggle, as we typically do, what we want to lean into is this. Look, we've got a peer support team. We've got a couple people designated per squad uh, and, or, you know, per, within your agency. The post-event personnel care planning is this. We got this grid. We're going to say, okay, um, Mike Stanley, what was his role in the event? Well, he was like the lead in that, and he has a personal experience of this connected with that. Okay, what was the event type? It was this. It was the death of a child. Okay, we know that's a big one. Wow, that's okay. So then um, let's connect up with him. Let's find out, Mike, can we take some time? Can we sit down? And Because uh, we just don't want to ignore. I know in the past we've buried stuff. We're not doing that anymore. This sucks for you. Can we take some time and just sit with this? Now, he might say, not right now. Okay, fine. We're not going to force in that moment. But in the first opportunity beyond just acknowledging, we sit down, and the question is, okay, hey, Mike, 
we've got a menu of, of care support here. We've got options to be able to come alongside you, and I want to share with you what those are and help you pick the ones that are going to be most helpful for you. And what those involve, folks, there's, there's, there are many resources that we can provide to somebody in this situation. And that, first of all, we would hope that that would include one of the leaders of the agency sitting and acknowledging, he might come on in, man, so that you have contact with, with the leader. When leaders don't acknowledge these events and they only delegate, that's going to be a miss at the end of the day. There's got to be at least some sit-down acknowledgement. Then the peer support team. This, this is a first discussion that we're having with, with, the, with Mike about this. What we might be offering to, to Mike is to be able to, first of all, just we hear them out. We don't just pass them to somebody. This is not pass the hot potato. The peer supporter is going to provide the space and the ability to really be able to hear out where Mike is coming from. You're going to look at what's going on with your family right now. What do we need to do to provide support for your family? What else? Mike, we'll talk about the EAP. Now, a lot of you guys out there have an EAP that is not doing the job. They don't get responders. I'm not trying to diss them, but we've got to have the APs who get our responders and who can provide what they need, employee assistance programs. And if they're not and people aren't using it and they're not showing up to do ride-alongs to, to understand and provide in-services on, on mental health, fire that EAP and get another one. Because we need to make sure that when we do the sit down, we can confidently tell Mike that there's an EAP that he can sit down and talk to somebody about. We need to know who our evidence-based clinicians are in the area, who's using, you know, the exposure therapy, who's using EMDR, who's legit. Uh, so we have to have a set of lists, assign somebody agency to explore with the help of a mental health professional uh, you trust from your EAP or elsewhere. Let's get a list of those people using those treatments. They may be in the AP, they may be beyond it. So what we're trying to do, folks, is systematically identify the resources that we can offer to Mike and that he can receive. And we may also offer to help him set that first appointment with the EAP or with the, uh, the clinician uh, who's an expert in uh, trauma. We may offer to go with him to the appointment. And this, our, our people are out there doing this now, so we may even offer to go with him because maybe he's hesitant to go. Uh, if there's an emergency, if he's in critical shape, like Mike was actually ready to go and end his own life, if they're at risk right now, we have a system set up so that we know we're going to go with that person like a chihuahua in the pant leg. We're not leaving him until we know we've bridged him to a professional who's with him on the phone or in person in assessing, evaluating, and building an immediate uh, urgent care plan or emergency plan for Mike. I'm going to pause right there and just uh, check in with you, Mike, see where we're at. No, that sounds, uh, that sounds good. Um, actually, while we're, while we're pausing real quick, I notice uh, uh, two people have got check marks by their names in the uh, participant window, Daniel Case and, uh, and Jose Morales. And uh, I'm not sure what a check mark means. Um, we usually use a hand raise if you've got a question. Um, so Jose or, or Daniel, if you've, uh, if you've got a, uh, uh, a question, please uh, please hit the hand raise, and I will uh, I will uh, definitely unmute you. And any of the rest of you, if you have uh, <clears throat> questions as we're going along here, feed, please uh, uh, feel free to to pop up with a with a hand raise or add something into the uh, into the chat window. Um, okay. I I really hey. uh, I I really do believe that this uh, this post uh, post event management. <clears throat> strategy is a huge missing link in our in our professional industry, Jim. Well, I, I do too, and it's not because people don't care. We just haven't known what to do about it. And let me emphasize, this is really a key, folks, as you're tuned in listening right now. What we're talking about, to some extent, is already being done in the first 24 hours, the first 72 hours. But what we're talking about in terms of post-event care planning is we're actually creating a grid with checklists in terms of the support services that Mike is going to receive in the next week, the next month, the next three months, the next six months, and the next 12 months, literally saying for every kind of support, uh, pastoral support maybe, uh, meeting with that therapist, how often do they want that to happen? We're not making him do this, but we're helping him organize this. How often do hey, listen, I, I'm your peer I'm willing to hang out with you. Can, would it be all right if we touch base once a week? You know what? We may do that over the next year because somebody's got to keep the pulse. They've got to know it's not forgotten. And so we're really looking at strategically planning support elements 
checking those in a, in a game plan, and then the peer gets a copy of that plan, you as, as the supporter get a copy of that plan, and it, the ball doesn't get dropped because we keep reviewing it every week. If we have multiple people, we have multiple peer supporters, they've got those plans, we keep coming back. That, that sounds great, Jim. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Maybe, you know, one of, the, one of the things I'm aware of <clears throat> is that um, when, you have a, when you have a significant event, you know, there tends to be multiple people who are exposed to the, the same traumatic event, and they have a, very, a variety of, uh, of responses. And I, I remember one of my uh, first personal exposures to a, a traumatic event. Um, I was working as a, a paramedic in, uh, in Denver in uh, 1981. Um, maybe, maybe You're old, Mike. Some, maybe before some of the people on the, on the call today were actually born. But, um, <clears throat> you know, we got a, a call. I was working in Denver. And I just dropped a patient at Denver General Hospital, and we got a, a call for a police officer down uh, after a shooting. And um, we were uh, close to stand balance, just a few blocks away, and, uh, and you know, kind of pulled up and hid behind a, a large apartment complex to see what was going on and, uh, and could peek around the, the complex and, uh, and uh, see uh, one officer down on the uh, on a sidewalk. Uh, in front of the house with an active gunfight going on between uh, somebody in the house and uh, uh, another officer who was crouched behind a, a parked car and, uh, you know, police coming in from all over the place and uh, <coughs> gunfire being exchanged um, back and forth. Mm. And wow. um, um, uh, watching uh, another uh, – uh, a, a sergeant, uh, Sergeant Dan, Don Simpson, a friend of mine, uh, coming down trying to get to the downed officer. And uh, just as he uh, he got to the officer who was down, uh, taking a, a shotgun blast to the chest and uh, and kind of watching a, uh, my friend get shot um, and get dropped next to the other officer who was down and not being able to, to get to him immediately in that moment. Um, and uh, And then somebody... Uh, said on the police radio, this was a, a, a you know a, a night a nighttime call, so it was it was dark out. But uh, somebody said that the the lights on the front porches and the street lights and all that were backlighting the officers and making them uh, easier targets. Um, so every mm -hmm. every cop out there all of a sudden shot out all of the all of the all of the street lights, all the lights on the front houses. There was just this cacophony of gunfire, and then. The, uh, we worked with the, the fire department uh, to go down um, and uh, and basically put a ballistic shield in a pumper, and uh, the SWAT team and us rode on the on the other other side of the pumper, and we uh, uh, went down, and the SWAT team said, "Well, <coughs> we'll give you 30 seconds of nonstop gunfire into the house, um, enough time to to run out and drag the the officers behind the pumper." Uh, to safety, so they, uh, you know, lit up uh, these H and K MP5s and uh, and nonstop gunfire into the house right next to that. We uh, ran in and extricated uh, both officers, literally dragging them uh, behind the the pumper and then backing the the pumper out. And mm -hmm. uh, the original officer did not survive. Uh, my buddy uh, cardiac arrested just as he hit the table in the trauma room at Denver General and. Uh, had his uh, chest split open and his uh, uh, heart sewn uh, a little uh, uh, double lot buck wound in it uh, sewn back together and his heart defibrillated and he uh, ultimately uh, survived to discharge. <clears throat> and I was, you know, very fortunate. My uh, my girlfriend at the time was an emergency medicine nurse and uh, um, I had taken the rest of the shift off after this and you know spent two hours kind of talking her through everything that happened and. Um, got a little sleep and had our our CISM the next day. Jeff Mitchell actually flew in to help facilitate, and uh, um, and, and you know I was sad for the loss of my friends and whatnot, but um, but I didn't I didn't have bad dreams. I didn't you know think about it all the time. I, mean, I thought about it you know for a while, but it kind of dissipated for me. Whereas uh, some of my uh, colleagues, uh, one from the fire department, a couple from the uh, the police department, had had real problems later on and I you know it was interesting that we all got exposed to the same same thing but some people really uh, didn't suffer 
post-traumatic stress injury or post-traumatic stress disorder, and um, other people um, really did. Um, and so I, mm -hmm. I, I think that, that concept of resilience is, is part of that. But I, I realize we, uh, we have a, do have a question in the chat window, so I'm going to hold that uh, resilience, moving on to resilience for a second. And uh, Kelly Dunn um, asked, what specifically is the process of EMDR? <laughs> people will want to know what they're getting into and uh, not be afraid of some sort of unknown voodoo treatment uh, when they are suffering from PTSI symptoms. Jim, would you uh, take a crack at answering that for her? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, I am glad that you brought up the idea of, okay, this is wacky voodoo. I call it the wacky eye movement treatment. Uh, it seems incredible, and so I welcome you to be skeptical. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I can tell you I've done about 10,000 hours of the EMDR therapy of the total 35,000 hours of therapy I've done. I'm not going woohoo for me, but to tell you, I don't continue using treatments that are ineffective because as you folks don't like to feel helpless uh, on scene, I don't like to feel hel uh, helpless with my clients either. So I've used treatments that are effective. Um, but what does it look like? What's actually happening? So now I want to emphasize there are eight phases to the EMDR treatment. We don't just start making their eyes move. Okay, so first we're doing very careful history. We're building them up with resources that will enable them in terms of skills, strategies, uh, and supports out there in their life, including friends, family, to make sure that they can manage the distress of going through the process. Because for some people, they may continue to have flashbacks outside of the sessions. They may be struggling significantly. We're not going to do EMDR if the person is imminently suicide, at risk of suicide or they radically lack support out there because traveling through it is difficult. So this is not, please hear me say, this is not a cookie cutter solution and the goal is not magic to get this done in one session. What we're doing is assessing then the person's strengths, the resources, and then along, based on the history that we've gotten, we identify what the core traumatic event is. So in Mike Stanley's situation, in some cases, it's a pile up and it's not just one run, it's a bunch of runs. We would choose the, a theme there, so it might be child runs. And it might be that you may not remember one event, but you still got like a, a memory that, uh, of those experiences. What we do is we identify, first of all, a picture, memory of that type of event as able. So we bring up the picture. We bring up then what's the thought that's there? with the person. This is when we're actually doing EMDR, the mechanics of it. So what's the thought? And I, as, I, as I shared with Mike Stanley, it's I failed. I, I, it's kind of like I failed, I deserve to die. Now I'm, I'm using Mike as an example. This, this is my quotes are not his, just an example. I deserve to die. Well, that would be why the person is struggling with suicide. Or I just can't take him or I'm, I'm, I'm done. This, it, it sucks. Okay. What would you like to be able to believe in though? It's, even though it seems untrue right now, what would you like to be able to believe? Well, I said I did the best I, I could. Okay, from one to seven, one to seven, and one is completely false, seven is completely true. How true does that feel right now? Don't fake it. We're not looking for, you know, magic here. How true does it feel right now that you did the best you could? It's okay to go on. It uh, feels like it doesn't at all. It's like a one, okay? Just asking. Then what's the emotion that's there when you look at the picture? I just feel failure. I feel guilt. I feel sorrow. Okay, zero to ten. We do emotions, zero to ten. Zero to ten, how strong is that emotion right now? Oh, it's like a 9 or a 10. I just feel sick. Okay, and where are you feeling it? Oh, it's in my gut. Okay, we're taking note of that. Now what we're going to do is let's zoom in on the picture. I'm going to begin to move my hand across your field of vision. This is when we're doing it old-style EMDR, eye movement desensitization. Now pause for a minute. The reason we're activating eye movements is because that's bilateral stimulation, right, left, right, left, of the right and left hemispheres. And I'm not going to get into the explanations of how the, why this works. Neuroscientists are still trying to figure it out. Let's just say the best data is there to prove that it, it does work. Okay, so what we're doing is activating eye movements. Now, you guys remember rapid eye movements, uh, REM stages of sleep? Every one of us, unless we're radically sleep impaired, is going to have REM stages of sleep. They're restorative. We might be dreaming during this time. We're processing information. Hmm. So eye movements are helping us process information and reprocess information. That is why I'm going to use my hand to follow across your field of vision, Mike. We'll zoom into the worst part of the picture. Here we go. And, I'm, and don't do this at home. <laughs> Please don't practice this at home. If you want to learn more, Google Francine Shapiro. Francine Shapiro is the, is the pioneer, the originator of this. This is the person I was trained by. So you can just Google her name, Francine Shapiro. 
So Mike, zoom in on the picture. Here we go, bring up that thought. I deserve to die, I failed, it's my fault. Here we go. And as I bring my hand across his field of vision, he's tracking with his eyes back and forth. The, a lot of the emotion and all of this emerges and he might feel a lot of emotion, a lot of stuff happening there. As we continue with sets of eye movements, uh, there's, there might, I might bring my hand across this field of vision 25, 35 times, and it varies depending on. But as I do that, you can watch the emotion changing. Take a deep breath, Mike, what's there now? Uh, and it might be, well, same, same friggin' picture, it's a little further away. Okay, where's the, where's the guilt at? Ah, uh, it's like an eight. Over time, the numbers go down, the picture fades, and the cognition changes so that as it's effective, what we're going to hear him saying is, I don't know, this is kind of weird, but I did do the best I could. Okay, go with that. Bring it up. And then we, we're, we're reprocessing that using the, the eye move sensitization. Uh, and, and that's how it goes. What ends up happening is the brain has ability to heal if we access that neural network. EMDR is helping process the information so that it changes, the emotion changes, the thoughts change. Now that is the down and dirty description. There are multiple protocols we use for different types of problems, including addiction, anxiety, panic attacks, et cetera. Got it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. You bet. You bet. Um, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll slide back here um, into talking a, a bit about the the resilience part of things, the, uh, <laughs> the taking your brain and your emotions to the gym. And uh, uh, Jim, you, you've used this uh, uh, battery um, example, which is, I think is a really wonderful way um, to explain uh, how resilience works. Can you kind of walk us through this? Yeah, and I'm glad we're coming back to, because some of our, our viewers and listeners might be saying, okay, but how do you do the resilience thing? And like, the idea is we can prevent, we can help prevent the, the, the serious, the most serious fallout, not in every case, but we're far more up to prevent PTSD, suicidality, uh, depression, people bailing, leaving their careers, if we are building resilience strategically. And this can be done. Yes, some people might be more uh, equipped with resilience when they come to, to day, day one of the job, but the fact is we can strategically build up the resilience of all our employees. And, and this brings us to the battery. When you look at the battery, what, you, what, you, what you're looking at is, think about your cell phone. That, that cell phone holds a charge for only so long, and the longer you use your cell phone, the weaker the, the capacity of the battery. Well, each of us has mojo inside of us. It's our battery to handle life, to face adversity, to weather adversity, which is a good down and dirty definition of resilience, is the ability to weather adversity. There's much more than that about it. Stephen Southwick, if you want to read a good book, Stephen Southwick, S-O-U-T-H-W-I-C-K. But so the battery analogy is this. We need to have the energy to face uh, and manage, travel through, and repair from difficult experiences that we've traveled through in life. So think about Mike's colleagues, Mike's friends, right? What are they gonna do to, to recharge the battery? What we have is a lot of medics and a lot of our responders, and they're living on caffeine and willpower and not enough sleep. So their, their resilience is compromised by the lack of sleep and the, the needing far more resource in their lives. The, the battery idea is we have to stay charged. We've gotta be in the green as much as possible because the less resilience we have, the more impacted we are psychologically by events, and the more it plays out in the quality of our life and our performance. That sounds good. So I'm just going to go ahead and move on to your uh, to your slide that talks about this in a little more a uh, little more detail. Is this this pretty much uh, cover what you already just said? It looks like. I think it does, and you can read that real quickly if you will. Um. Well, so I mean, basically, that uh, resilience is the capacity or ability to. Prepare for, recover from, and adapt in the face of stress, adversity, trauma, or tragedy. It's the energy you have available to use for physical, mental, and emotional needs. Like a battery to draw upon to handle your daily challenges, duties, and to remain calm and think clearly and be in control of your emotions. And rather than become stressed out, uh, which further drains your energy reserves. And uh, one of the one of the kind of definitions, if you will, of um, resilience that I've been <clears throat> working with is is the ability ability to advance despite adversity. 
um, mm-hmm. which is, uh, you know, it's not, not only the, the recovering, but it's really the ability to, to move ahead with your life. Um, mm-hmm. And then uh, and I'd love for you to, to respond to that, that, just that thought and what you think about that. And then we've got a couple of questions in the, uh, in the chat box that we should, uh, we should attend to. You bet. Great. Uh, tell me how much time we have left so I can be sure I manage our time well. We have 33 minutes left. Awesome. Okay. So, first of all, I, I love that definition, the ability to advance our lives, it, we wouldn't say necessarily despite, but in the face of adversity, because I don't know about all you guys, but the longer you live, the more you realize it's only calm for a while. <laughs> and then, then crap happens again, right? So, we're always facing adversity. How are we able to advance through that? Not only weather it, but advance <laughs> through it. Okay, so this comes really comes back to how do you build resilience? Does that make sense, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so, and, and before before we totally dive into how do we uh, build resilience and the resilience skill set, I wonder if we should yeah. answer these couple of questions real quick. Sure, let's do it. So the the question from uh, from Lynn, uh, let's see here, is uh, is EMDR effective for 911 staff where cumulative and vicarious trauma issues are the main cause instead of a specific traumatic event? How does that how does it work for cumulative stress as compared to a specific event? Outstanding question, and the answer is yes. I've referred, I, want, I don't want to overestimate this, but everywhere I go, I'm bridging uh, our, our, our responders, beginning with 911, the very first responder, and our field responders now. I'm bridging them to EMDR therapists, and the stories we're getting back are almost always that this was very helpful to me. So how do we do this? Let's let's take the most challenging scenario. That maybe the uh, what was the the caller's name or the uh, the participant's name? Uh, Kelly. Was, uh, Linden. Linden. Okay, thank you. Linden. So, so it's a great question. Let's take the most challenging situations. Like I can't seem to. I don't have any call in mind. It's not like a particular call or a particular run. It's just that it's this pile up in me. Okay, so we take that as a starting point. I would I would say, well, is there a category of call that you think has probably affected you the most? Well, yeah, it's like the kids' calls, and then there's like officer down. Like I've been through like officer involved shooting like twice. Okay, let's take these one at a time. First, let's look at the calls involving children. And forgive me, folks, I'm at a fire station teaching right now in Madison, so there's a tone right now, if you can hear that, ironically. Um, so let's take the child calls first. Um, and, and what, what we go with is you may not have an actual picture in your mind. You don't necessarily have to have pictures, emotions, thoughts, and sensations, all four, to begin doing EMDR. What you might have, though, is, okay, when you think of those calls, what's, when you think of how those have affected you, what's kind of the bottom line there? And I don't know, Mike, you, you might think of something. You can jump in if you want, but when you think about your, your, run, your runs as a, as a medic, what, and, and you realize that you're, you're burned out by this. You know, it's like the cumulative impact. It's like, I don't know, I just want to bail, or I just, I just don't have a heart for this anymore. Yeah, what would you know, be kind you know, of the... Jim, it's interesting. When you, uh, when you ask that question, I don't think about calls. I think about supervisors that were a pain in the ass to interact with or, uh, or, uh, <laughs> or our, our, our freaking scheduling program, or um, I worked two shifts of overtime last week and it didn't show up on my paycheck. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when I when I think of cumulative stress for myself, calls calls were not part of the stressor for me, but it was all the yep. other crap associated with being an employee that uh, that made me crazy. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, and you know, a lot of our veterans are going to say that. I know that I've heard that in the classroom. Let me just say this: for you, that may have been the case, as evidenced by the fact that you were able to maintain and function and advance in your life without these things affecting you. We've got other veterans who've said that. And then they hit the wall, and we realize they've been stuffing way too much crap for too long. So I just want to make a point, but I, I agree. I hear what you're saying. Um, so we could take a situation where it's like, you know, management always screws us over, which managers love to hear. If you're on this call right now, it's like, yeah, we always get kind of beat up for, you know, we're the cause of all evil in our agencies, right? But, you know, if now that's a little more complicated uh, for, than I can explain in this moment because what I'm going to be looking for there is if I have a uh, – a, a, a responder who's saying, you know, my burnout is because of, of management. My burnout is because of these supervisors. What I'm really looking at is what's the core belief there? If the core belief is they're stuck too much in a victim mentality, 
like everybody always screws me over or I can't do anything because they're paralyzing me. We're going to look at that as a belief that's in their way. Does that make sense, Mike? That totally makes sense. Okay, so then what would you like the belief to be, Mike? You know, the, you know you're, unless you're talking about bailing from the job right now, and I didn't hear that from you, you, you feel like you've had a succession of supervisors, they've made your life miserable. But you want to be able to stay in your job, I think I heard you say that. So what would you I, want I, to be able to believe to, or tell I yourself? Stay, I want to be, in, I want to be in, in my job. I just, I want to be in charge for two months so I can fix all the stuff that drives me nuts and then go back to the street. That's how I feel. Okay. <laughs> Well, if that's the case, then I'm not going to just use EMDR. In that case, we're going to evaluate. We're going to talk about realistic expectations and how much real, you know, realistically how much they can do that. Sometimes therapy is not about trauma; it's about helping a person get more realistic expectations. So that what? So they can take responsibility effectively for their life situation right now. If they make themselves miserable by having unrealistic goals, part of the job of therapy, now I'm not a hand holder and take the money. Sometimes we've got to help them see that they're sabotaging themselves. Now, sure. if we come back, though, to the question of the caller with, with EMDR, I'm going to assume that there's cumulative stress there from any source. I've addressed the, what, what you brought up, but if it is the calls, and it is for more of our people than are acknowledging it, at least that, that is a factor, then I'm going to help identify the call type and ask them to bring up, you know, what is that thought? Oh, I, I, I hate the helplessness. Okay, so helplessness. What do you want to be able to say to yourself as opposed to, you know, I, I can't do this? Well, um, I can manage this with new skills. Okay, so we're going to go into that. We're going to, what will happen is the memories will start to come up. As we start to do EMDR, her brain will start to bring up those, and then we'll focus on the first one or the worst one or the last one, and we'll then reprocess that one. And here's the cool thing. I, I imagine people are getting a little overwhelmed by this explanation, but here's the cool thing. When you address a category, one event from a major category like child calls, when you successfully reprocess and desensitize that experience, it can have a domino effect where others are automatically being reprocessed with it so that when we bring those other experiences up, they don't feel the same either. They don't seem the same. So there is a generalizing effect of the, of the, of the healing. Not always, not guaranteeing, but it happens. That, that sounds good. That sounds good. Let's. Uh... Let's move on to Jose's question. Um, okay. Jose says, uh, is there a specific curriculum you recommend for people like me who are trying to get educated and use this education to establish policies and procedures and be more involved with the overall mental health initiative? <laughs> that is a beautiful question, but I feel like <laughs> I have a conflict of interest in answering that question because uh, – Frankly, the reason that I was brought into EMF uh, by Jay uh, and by other people and why you and I are working together and Todd Stout is because yeah. there's been a lack of curriculum in this area. And quite frankly, you know, that's what I teach uh, for leaders and for our followers is how to build out your program to boost resilience. I'm just, so I'm just being honest with you. I mean, I can give you more information. Uh, my email will be available to you. Um, and I, so there's just not enough like this. Uh, we have some training that's out there, but we need to be sure that the training is, is based on evidence and that it's customized to your responders. Any, you can search the Internet. I'll be happy to help you find anything other than mine, too. I don't want to be promoting. I mean, yeah, sure, I want you to come to my classes. but <laughs> I'll, 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 pr I'll promote you so you don't have to promote yourself. Jim's classes are wonderful. I got to take a, a full day one here recently at a conference. It was amazing. Uh, okay, so let's we'll, move on. We'll, we'll make them, them, <laughs> them uncomfortable and move on. Um, and and in the in the in the spirit of uh, being fully fully transparent on conflict of interest, potentially is uh, uh, first watch is is going to be at Pinnacle introducing a a new uh, a new approach to resilience building that uh, that we'll be able to to tell you about um, at at Pinnacle and there uh, shortly thereafter. Um, which, uh, which, which certainly can help. Um, but uh, uh, to, to close out with Jose, I'm, I am, and, and Jim, we're happy to email back and forth and, and, uh, and work with you to get specific about what it is you're, uh, you're looking to learn um, and, you know, kind of in the whole domain of, of wellness and wellness initiatives that are effective and, and those kinds of things for your folks. Um, and let's, uh, Jim, let's move on to, uh, 
to your uh, resilient uh, skill set um, using the cues to create uh, choice point in SIA. I love this framework. So uh, just tell me when to advance the slides and I'll do it for you. Okay. So uh, I'll just, you'll, you'll know what to do as I just I, as I describe this. I think uh, Mike will leave it there. Uh, but so the idea is this: uh, we can teach people resilient skills that they can use in the moment, and, and we need to teach them that because cortisol is not our enemy. We've all heard of, of cortisol. Cortisol is not the enemy, and, and stress doesn't kill us. It's, it's what we do or don't do with the stress and how we manage the cortisol. But So I could say, well, let me teach you a, a set of evidence-based uh, resilient skills that ha can help you shut down production of cortisol, right? Okay, that's great. But if, uh, but, uh, if you're not thinking and not attuned to the stress in real time, you can, you're not going to use the skills. So in other words, we right. have to teach people to be aware of their own cues that they need to implement the skills. Does that make sense? That makes great sense to me. Okay, so check this out. Think about this. Our responders have trained themselves to disregard, disregard the cues. So in other words, if they have a thought in their head like, oh, sh I kill, oh, crap, I can't do this, they're supposed to stuff that. If they have fear or distress, they're supposed to stuff that. If they feel in the stomach, disregard it. Why? Because job number one is take care of the patient. Here's the deal. What we know from newer science, better science, is that hasn't worked. Sucking it up in itself has, is not as effective. Yeah, you're going to be able to rock in that moment, but the cumulative impact is far, far greater. And there's something better we can do that works with your neuroscience and your physiology. What is that? We notice the cues to do something smart for us. The choice point, you guys, see that diagram. You've got an incoming stressor, right? So like you're on, a, you're on a bad run, or you take your supervisor situation. Let's move away from big T trauma for a minute. Let's say, you know, you got a supervisor that, that, that yanks your chain and you've been written up because you know what, you've, your mouth has gotten you in trouble. You're a great person, but you couldn't, you just, you were, you were done. Okay, in, the situ, in that situation, the stressor is the supervisor and what they said. Now it may be how you're perceiving and maybe they're doing fine, but perception is reality. So the, the, uh, the stressor we could say is, the supervisor, you have an acute stress response. The thought is, what an idiot. I can't take any more. You might feel it in your chest, and the, and the emotion is anger and frustration. So now you're at an intersection in time. That just happened. That's the past. Now you're in the present. How are you going to use the present to your advantage, not to your disadvantage? Because you're going to create your future. If you look to the other side of the diagram, you're going to create your future for better or for worse. And the question I would ask you guys is, you ever said something you wish hadn't said, and then it was too late? Right? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, like, welcome to the human family here. Okay. So, we want to not be impulsive. We want to not just react. And we also don't want to just suck up the stress that's going to eat us alive from the inside out in some way. What that means, then, is we need to create the choice point, which is the intersection between the moment that just happened and my future. How do I do that? You notice on the diagram, option number three is, I might notice my cue, but I believe it. What does that mean? I'm angry, therefore I have a right to say whatever I want. Okay. We just blew through the intersection, and you can see the negative fallout. Now let's back it up. Old school, classic, EMS, 911 is suck it up. Now that means I ignore it. I disregard the cues. Well, then I'm going to blow through that. It might be that I'm passive aggressive, or I'm just ignoring, or I'm just shutting down. And they're, what they're picking up is uh, this person's got an attitude. Okay, the old attitude thing. Now that's having negative fallout. What we want to do at the choice point is we want to notice the cues instead of disregarding them. Is this the, look, you can do this in an instant. It doesn't take long. And I'm training people right now in Madison to do this as we're speaking. In fact, I have to go back in the room in a minute here to continue the training, yep. just so you know. Okay, so what are, we doing to, what are we going to do to notice the cue? We, we recognize right now, wait a minute, stop. I'm, I'm honked off. I can feel it in my chest. All I need is one cue, what I'm feeling in my chest, my chest pounding, or it's the emotion. I am so angry right now, or it's the thought, he's an idiot. Okay, stop action right now. Hit the brakes, pull into the Walgreens, and what I'm we teach people to do is, uh, for example, heart-focused breathing. We're syncing the heart, changing heart rhythm patterns, so you're not just in, in the limbic system on fire, but you're activating the prefrontal cortex to dance with the limbic system so that you have your best brain and you downregulate, you, you bring your heart rate down, but also you create better heart rhythm patterns. Your brain is dancing along now. Stop, take the breath, just a couple of breaths while they're talking. We can do it. And so now what's the, what's the smartest thing to do? Okay, you know what? I need to acknowledge what's happening right now and I'm not gonna blow. I'm gonna save it for later. 
I need to travel through this. I'm not stuffing. I'm traveling through it. Let the event happen with the supervisor. Then later on, it's time to decide constructively what you're going to do about that situation. But that's an example of you're not only teaching resilient skills to manage the stress in the moment, when you take those breaths and when you then practice these kinds of skills before, during, and after events like this, you're recharging your resilience battery, you're protecting your resilience, you're also protecting your resilience because you didn't just create more crap for yourself you've got to live with. <laughs> Period. Yep. Sounds good. Definitely sounds good. Um, anything else on this kind of uh, kind of base issue around uh, choice points and this aspect of resilience? Well, just this, folks. We we don't want to give away our ability, our power to manage your own lives. I think the biggest adult question is, what do we do with what we can't control? You, you, you all know, you've been around the block many times, you know we can't control circumstances. And yet it sounds cliche to say, but we can control our reaction to it, blah, blah, blah. No, no, I'm saying let's equip our, our people to do that in real time effectively, to notice when they're at a choice point and to zig instead of zag, using skill sets and a mindset that will change not necessarily the outcome of the event, but the outcome for them personally. And that's what this is all about. Resilience is achieved through gaining a healthier mindset, getting rid of the suck it up. Yeah, we got to be mentally tough. It's achieved through peer support, living with each other so that people don't feel alone. It's achieved by getting the help we need preventively in treatment and therapy, not just when we hit the wall completely. And it's also restored when we go through healing after crap has happened as well. So all of sounds, those involve choice points. I, I love that. I love that. It sounds it sounds good, and it gives you the power back. I'm gonna. Looks like we have a, a question from our uh, our friend Sarah McEntee. Um Sarah, do you have a question for us? I've unmuted you. I'm not sure. I've got yeah. a good picture here. There you go. We can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Yes, um, and this has been fantastic. It's, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear the reframing of post-traumatic stress disorder to post-traumatic stress injury. And all of this has focused quite a bit on, you know, redefining and re-looking re at that from a perspective of it's not, these people aren't broken. Um, they're not somehow damaged goods in our industry. Uh, this is something that is is not only, um, as you said, manageable, but, but we can resolve this. We can fix this. We can we can really do some amazing things for our our workforce, our people, our, and also focusing on the evidence based treatment. And then we were just getting into that immediate at the moment we have a decision to make choice point. What are some things that we can be doing to help our help give them those choice points? Give them the ability to I even recognize when they have a choice point. Um, and begin to make those those better sort of reframing decisions at the moment. And then also, even before they hit that moment, that exact moment, what sort of things can we be doing for them um, in advance that aren't just our typical, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's easy to fall into. Uh, we give them weight rooms and exercise programs and things. But what sort of things are there that we can be doing to help them prepare for those choice points when they arise and maybe help them uh, recharge those batteries so that when they're at a choice point, they're more likely to recognize it and, and implement it? Mm. Jim, Jim, you want to take the first track there? Yeah, absolutely. Now, and I just want to clarify, if I understand the, the question correctly, I got the last part there in terms of what can we do ahead of time to predispose and help our people be in the frame of mind that they would use choice points, I think, in terms of yeah. what, how do we get beyond the, the rudimentary, hey, there's a weight room, go use it. Yeah. Um, and, okay. I'm going to address that one. Um, first, I'm not sure I can. Um, I might need clarity about the second one there, and then I will have to. I will have to bail. Um, I think it's. Been, has it been an hour already? Uh, it was scheduled for an hour and a half, Jim. Sorry. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So, uh, anyhow, let, that's a tremendous question, and here's here's what I'm going to offer on this. Um, the reality is that the leaders of our EMS organizations and our comm centers are 
typically maxed out already. There's so much that you're already trying to do. It's very hard to prioritize another major issue like this. So we've got to be realistic because the answer to your question really is about creating a, a sea change. It's really about changing the culture in our agencies and our organizations, right? Uh, and how do we achieve that sea change? Well, you know, it, there is some time that has to be invested by the leaders to, to engage in training. I don't care whether it's mine or somebody else's, as long as it's good. But we have to teach people about where they've been as a culture, dealing with stress of all kinds, the big T traumatic stresses, but also stressors that are the everyday things. We have to re-educate the way they're relating to their lives and to their stressors. That's very important. And, and so that has to involve investment in training. Our leaders have to be trained in that as well, at least in abbreviated forms of that. And we have to put our people through that. Then we're empowering our people to use it. See, it's not just skills. It's not cookie cutter stuff only. It's, it's the mindset. There's a resilient EMS and 911 mindset. We have to lead people through training where it's not PowerPoint and bullets, but it's in a different kind of dialogue and discussion we're actually having in groups like this so that they are realizing where they've been and where they need to go that's different. We move from suck it up to we're going to get each other's backs and acknowledge this stuff. We're not all becoming namby-pamby and holding each other's hands all the time and breaking down about every little thing. It's that we're facing crap in real time. So I think the baseline needs to be that we're working with, with training to help change the way we roll as the responder families uh, in real time. It's building out peer support programs. The best way to answer your question is we need to build peer support programs because they're in place preventively. And people can come to them before it, it leads to, you know, cumulative chaos in their lives. Uh, then certainly deploying the skills. It's also about building those relationships with clinicians in the area who are going to learn to or already get your responders and EAPs that really, really function. There's multiple parts to this but it's doable and it begins with, you know, a plan and I'm happy to help with that. So that's, I think that's the best I can offer on that part of it. Thank, thank you, Jim. I, I, I actually just, uh, as, as you're, as you're talking through this, uh, uh, Sarah, I know that you're, uh, you have been uh, very involved in uh, yoga and yoga teaching and it's, uh, it's relationship to uh, uh, emergency uh, responders and emergency services folks. And uh, then I have a theory, um, at least from the, the little bit of uh, yoga that I've done, that uh, uh, learning how to pay more attention to your body, uh, being able to hang in with a little bit of an initial pain response to, to find something new. Um, don't, don't know that I can prove it yet, but I have a theory that uh, the practices like yoga can uh, – can be part of helping helping build resilience for folks. So, um, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you for your question. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on uh, to uh, uh, Joan uh, has uh, has asked a question as well. Joan, uh, you're unmuted. Can you hear us? Hi. Yep, I can hear you. Hi, it's Joan Malore with the Line of Health EMS. I was just wondering. Yeah. You talked about your training um, in terms of in-person training and with large workforces. Have you done any kind of um, thinking around um, a diversified workforce type training if, if, if it's webinars or, you know, just getting to the medics um, in this um, space of having people across a wide geography and really difficult cost-wise to train so many people? We have 600 plus um, if you have any presentations there. And so when you, uh, when you, when you see the the offering that we're going to be rolling out at Pinnacle, you'll you'll have a good sense of a uh, a training program that is designed for exactly exactly that focus. Jim, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think so. I think you know you're talking about engaging. Thank you so much for that question. I, I think there's a couple elements of support and care to make it possible to 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 train a a, a large workforce. Um, there are some caveats to that. We want to make sure that the quality is not eroded by being too online. And the feedback I get from uh, a lot of my, my students, 
uh, is we, we want this in person. Well, you know, we have to be realistic about this. And so there are a couple options here that we can achieve. Uh, and so one is if you have something that's available via software that, that where there's self-guided training and instruction and then skill sets and all that, um, that's what you're going to learn more about at Pinnacle with, with uh, First Watch. It's amazing that they've come into this realm. But then also there's training that I provide in the classroom which we can train a core group of your people to then teach other people. So we train the trainers. And then what you have then is mentors on the ground to continue helping those people. So there's the ability to train trainers who will then be forces and sources of support ongoing there as well. We can then mix that with a uh, one hour, 30 minute uh, collection of, of, of trainings that are web-based and you can access as a library over time as well. So we can blend those, these three elements. That Got it. sounds thanks. good. Go ahead, John. No, just wanted to say thanks. That's helpful. Perfect. Perfect. You Perfect. Bet. So, so as we uh, as we get toward the uh, the end of our our session here, one of the things I just wanted to uh, mention is some uh, emerging uh, research that I've been uh, diving in the last uh, last couple of days. Actually, um, uh, talks about the relationship. Uh, between compassion and and the showing of compassion to your colleagues and to your your patients and uh, first off um, an amazing amount of hardcore research science um, that shows that the the display of compassion um, you know improves uh, um, adherence for diabetics and decreases people's hemoglobin A1C levels. Um, that it shortens uh, the time to recovery for people from gunshot wounds, stab wounds, car accidents, and, uh, and major trauma in major ways. It's pretty, uh, pretty remarkable, uh, remarkable hardcore science. But one, one aspect of it that is, uh, that is fascinating that I think we're just learning about is how um, showing compassion to others helps you build resilience for yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that it not mm -hmm. only is good for the people you're caring for, good for the your colleagues, um, but it's also really good for you as an individual. And in that the more um, compassionate you are, um, compassion being not only the ability to recognize uh, suffering in others, which is really empathy, but compassion is uh, taking action uh, to ease or relieve that suffering when you uh, when you see it and identify it, um, mm -hmm. and that 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 has a has a blowback. Of uh, pretty tangibly increasing increasing your resilience. Um, mm -hmm. So before we uh, wrap up here, um, any uh, any last uh, last questions from anybody or any uh, last comments, Jim? Uh, I'll pause if there's a question. Uh, then I'm prepared to make a, a wrap up statement here. No, we've got all the questions, so nobody's got one at this point in time. Uh, I don't, they won't be shy about jumping in if they've got one. So. Okie dokie. Ahead, so, um, yes, indeed, what, what you just said with regard to compassion, it's a great way to bring us to a close here today. And I, I want to thank people again. You, you guys, this is not me pandering to you. I can't tell you what it means. Again, I'm the brother of a responder, and I, the responders in my life have become dear, dear people. To know that you are people logging into this webinar, that you're prioritizing this, is really about saving the lives of everyone. And we have all these beautiful cliches now, let's help save the lives of those who are saving lives. But I mean, legit thank you for what you're doing for making these choices because we want to be able to look back at the end of our lives when we're the old people that are retired and nobody remembers and feel like at peace that we've done all we can do and i think this is part of doing all we can do to the point of compassion the the research is absolutely supporting that and the, you're making biochemical changes when you practice compassion you activate oxytocin which is really good stuff and that in turn builds your ability to, uh, to for more attachment and, and, and bridge building with other people but let me back up and just end with a real concrete challenge here and that is which has been put to me fair enough but how are we supposed to have compassion when we've seen so much that, you know what, I don't want to have to feel deeply for everybody. And some of the stuff people bring on themselves, so like, sorry, but compassion can be overused. Let me say this, and this is not to contradict what Mike's saying, it's to make his message accessible to you. And that is part of the work of training that we need to do with responders is not to tell them you should care more, you should be more compassionate. No, no, there's great benefit from compassion, but here's the challenge. We need to help them reinterpret 
a lot of the suffering that they themselves have experienced, a lot of the a lot of the struggle with compassion our responders have is for themselves. They beat themselves up more than they beat up anybody else. So we work That's strategically so on self compassion, right? We need to work strategically on self compassion also we, we cannot manufacture phony compassion. When we gain new insight, look with ignorance, good people judge and do great harm. But with new insight, we can wonder compassionately and do great good. That's my bottom line. And thank you uh, so much. Th thank you so much for being with us today, uh, today, Jim. I have uh, I have uh, really uh, had my my world and my uh, my brain and my heart enriched by uh, by every time I get a chance to spend time with you. Um, thank you, and, Mike. Too, Mike. Uh, thank so you. Thank you, sir. And for uh, for those of you that are on the webinar today, um, there is a, a discount uh, to attend the Pinnacle Conference. Uh, all attendees uh, today are eligible for the First Watch discount. Um, so when you go to uh, www.pinnacle.ems.com uh, uh, registration or pinnacle-ems.com registration and enter FW50, FW50, you'll save $50 off the main conference registration. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, the, the small print here says it's not to be used in conjunction with the uh, other uh, main conference discounts. But uh, uh, for $50 off for attending today, it's a, it's a little thank you uh, from the team here. Um, so <clears throat> First Watch is a, a strategic partner of, uh, of Pinnacle and, uh, and Ninth Brain is the education partner. Uh, so from uh, Fitch and Associates, uh, the team at First Watch and Pinnacle, um, we uh, really thank you for your attendance today. You will be getting a um, follow-up email um, with a reminder of your discount, uh, ways to communicate with Jim and me anytime you want, and we're, uh, we're always happy to help after this. Thank you so much for attending.